Okay, welcome to Autism Spa. We're here with Dr. Kamran Falapur uh, with Vital Neuro. He's going to tell us a little bit about his background, how did, how did he get into this field, and really share some amazing examples of the science and technology behind uh, the company. Dr. Falapur, welcome to Autism Spa. We can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so just a bit about my background. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist uh, and neuroscientist, so I have 20 some years of experience in the field. I started really in clinical psychology um, with emphasis on psychophysiology and brain mapping and so on. So uh, my interest was uh, kind of how neuroscience and research in the past few decades of neuroscience has enabled us to understand more uh, brain dynamics, cognitive processes, and basically how we can do better assessments and also treatments with these new findings that are at our disposal. So uh, I have a private practice, uh, the Brain Resource Center in New York City, Upper West Side, where you know we see clients here. And we also have um, you know some research background we've done pharma trials, we've done um, biomedical research in neuroscience and so on. So we've been kind of very active uh, in terms of uh, trying to get in, to get into the bottom line of when someone has an issue with emotions, with cognition, with language, with movement, with mood, um, with sleep, what's at the bottom line? How is it that the brain of that person uh, acts differently and functions differently um, compared to the norms, which would be like a population that's like similar age, similar sex, similar, similar level of education, and then we can basically compare. And then those findings, once we know what the uh, differences are in brain dynamics, then we actually have ways to retrain the brain uh, and allow the brain to little by little rewire itself to get closer to the norm. Mm. And in that process, we actually see symptoms change, people improving their mood, their cognitive abilities, such as you know, memory, attention, focus, impulse control, you know, uh, the whole gamut of both emotional life and also cognitive life, we can see that change. So that's kind of what we've been doing for the past 20 some years, which is really my uh, clinical practice. And then you also mentioned Vital Neuro, which is really um, an offshoot of uh, my own practice and some collaborations uh, with Alex, which we talked about earlier, that we are basically um, trying to put this technology, this kind of intervention, both in terms of assessment and also treatment out there for the general population. Because people who come to my, my practice uh, are basically local and they're people who have access uh, to come visit us. Uh, but there's a lot more people who can benefit from these technologies and you know, these interventions. And Vital Neuro is really a vehicle to kind of put it out there for uh, people who cannot necessarily go to a clinic like this one to really benefit from uh, what it offers. Wow, I mean, I think this is really the tenor of the conversation I'm having with a lot of experts, a lot of doctors. You know, most special needs families have been relegated to deal with the ABA therapies from institutions. Insurance covered, education issued, whether it helps or not, no one seems to care. Uh, right. right, and so I'm really interested to see how uh, what you're doing and your research, uh, not only in your practice but with Vital Neuro, how that can offer a supplement to families in addition to ABA, uh, if that's Absolutely. worth it. I'll talk to you about, and of course the audience too, about generally what it is we do clinically, but then I'll also connect it to what Vital Neuro can do. Um, because probably majority of people don't have access to come see us sure. um, unless they're in New York City. Um, then kind of talk about how some of the technology that we have developed 
can actually help both parents and children with um, autism and the spectrum. Okay, sure. sure. Uh, how much would you like me to talk about general? I understand your audience is pretty diverse and they already know what autism is, they know yeah. the stats, all of that, so. Well, well, you know what, I get, you know, uh, I think the feedback I'm getting, I get families and friends that watch because, not mine, but families and friends of special needs uh, folks that watch and they learn something new about autism that they didn't know. Uh, yeah, let me, let me then just say few words, kind of generalities. Basically, sure. autism spectrum disorders is characterized by social and communication impairments and by restricted and stereotype behaviors, but also there is cognitive components involved. And from person to person, these may vary. So in a, it's, it's a broad range of conditions that are basically characterized by challenges, again, with social skills, repetitive behavior, cognition, speech, and even nonverbal communication. Right. Uh, so it's really a group of complex and homo uh, heterogeneous uh, developmental disorder, if you will, mm. and uh, it involves multiple neural system, etc. Um, as far as uh, anatomical brain abnormalities, and you know there are genetic abnormalities, uh, there is neurochemical uh, dysfunction, and there is neurotransmitters involved, and we won't get into all of that. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll get more into specifically into the brain dynamics and uh, brain electrical activity, which is really the type of work that we are involved with and how both the assessment and also intervention or treatment can benefit from this type of imaging. Okay, sure. So, sure. Uh, and uh, as far as statistics, uh, I'm sure by now this may be updated, but you're probably aware one out of 88 children or something like that, and one out of 54 males. So the, the ratio of males is more. Right. Um, yeah, so that's kind of generally about that. The genes we won't talk about, but there's no single gene that's been identified, basically. There are multiple. Right. And there are people who have those genes and don't have autism. So. Oh, and, and some families that have four kids on the spectrum, uh, three or four, I mean, right, right after another. Uh, and I think uh, one statistic I also read didn't apply to me because I have two boys, one on the spectrum, one not, uh, is that if you have uh, one child on the spectrum, it's four times as likely as your second child will be on the spectrum. Uh, right. th my second one was not. Uh, he's, he's brilliant in his own way, uh, but he's not on the spectrum. But so many families are struggling uh, with three or four kids with various degrees of impairment from MR, mental retardation, as well as all the spectrum disorders to very mild socialization issues. Uh, and all of these folks are diagnosed to be on the spectrum and receive various degrees of help. Um, sometimes not effective uh, to really help them. Right, right. So that's, that's important. Yeah. So, um, Let's get a little bit into um, maybe EEG, which is sure. electroencephalography. It's yeah. kind of one of the imaging techniques that are used often for, it, it used to be more uh, specifically for seizure disorders and some other neurological disorders. But these days, what we also do is quantitative EEG, which is basically a uh, much more in-depth statistical analysis and comparison to norms. Mm -hmm. So we can actually look at an individual's um, brain activity, measure it with non-invasive methods. Do you know, they're just surface electrodes. Sure. You've probably seen these caps that they put on uh, sure. people's head and they have sensors, nothing goes in. We don't just record their brain activity. Sure. And we sometimes take them through some activation paths, meaning that some challenges that they do cognitively, uh, you know, process auditory information, visual information. And, and if, if I may add, uh, a lot of families I've talked with uh, didn't know they can ask for their child to be tested for seizures uh, using uh, some of those techniques. In fact. Uh, taking uh, the child home, having the monitors on for a day, 
yeah. seeing how he sleeps. Some families realize that their child was having seizures. They just never knew it. Uh, so yeah, that yeah, brain activity. Absolutely. You're 100% you're correct. In fact, uh, there are lots of studies that show, and, and maybe uh, uh, some of them show up to about 60% of individuals with autism have no clinical history of seizures, but they display right. epileptiform abnormalities. That right. means the signature of something that is abnormal that is often found in people with seizure is present there. Wow. So, yeah. but let's talk about what EEG is. Sure. EEG is really, um, you know, uh, electrical activity in the brain that are the neurons in our brain are firing different regions at all times at different rates. And uh, we can actually measure not only um, the, the activity, but also the relationship between them. There are norms involved. And, you know, if we can actually compare again the norms. Uh, with someone of that particular age range, then we can say, okay, this is within the norm or it's not within the norm. Right. Just a little bit about what these mean. You know, the EEG spectrum uh, usually is measured between zero to about 40, 42 hertz. Mm -hmm. And then they are divided into different bands. So for instance, delta, which is about zero to four hertz, mm -hmm. normally they're observed uh, and they're dominant in deep sleep. Although, you know, individuals could, have, could display that at waking time, but it's not dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have theta that's commonly seen in some relation to memory process, but also when people are deep into meditative state, in creative states, and uh, what uh, another state um, called hypnagogic state, when people are uh, right before they're like falling asleep and getting into sleep. Mm -hmm. Then we have alpha waves that are more present in a relaxed but wakeful state. And then we have beta that's more um, about your attention towards the world and when you are wakeful and just focusing in the external world. And all of those then have other breakdowns and so forth. Mm -hmm. So when we do a brain map, when we do a quantitative EEG, what we're looking at, we're looking at these brain regions, brain activity, and how they are different in this population compared to norms. Mm. And the resting EEG, meaning that at that point, let's say the child or the adult um, is not doing anything. They're just sitting there with eyes closed or eyes open. We do both conditions. And then we look at their brain activity and then we record that, we compare it to norms. And if I want to kind of summarize the findings that I've seen in my clinic, but also is found uh, throughout literature about autism and quantitative EEG, is that we pretty much have three abnormalities that we see. One is that there is um, abnormal power. In other words, the... Um, voltage, if you will, the power uh, spectrum of brain activity in various regions are not normal. And I'll explain a little bit later how they're not normal. Mm -hmm. Then we have some level of abnormal hemispheric asymmetry, meaning that the left and right brain don't seem to be functioning similarly. Of course, in normal adults, that's also the case, but not to this extent. Then we see also something called a, a coherence abnormality, meaning that the different regions in the brain communicating to one another is not normal. Mm -hmm. And I'll go a little bit deeper on, on these. That basically, the, uh, when it comes to power or the power of the electrical activity in the brain, basically both my observations in my clinic and also the literature suggests that there is a U-shaped pattern of power abnormalities, which means overall, um, you know, there is, um, you know, if I want to kind of think about a graph, you know, delta and theta power are increased, beta and gamma are increased, but alpha is decreased. In other words, compared to norms, 
these are the abnormalities that we see in this particular po population. Lower alpha, but everything else is kind of high. Interesting. I can actually show you, maybe, yeah. let me see if I can share my screen and see if I can show you an example of that. Uh, let's see. Because visually, I think it's uh, it's good to see what that looks like. And you know, whether you're you have autism or you're on the spectrum or not, I think every human being will find their brain patterns interesting. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, so I don't know if you can see the screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So here we have from one to forty-two hertz, and exactly. Uh, similar to a lot of research that's been done in the field. This is from my own clinic. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at increase in slow activity, the red that you see here from one to about five hertz. Wow. Then we have increased beta. We have everything about you know, 13, 14 and above. It's all escalated. And the blue denotes the lower power within you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 within alpha. Okay. okay, so it's pretty much consistent with what the literature says. And this is again, from a child that we uh, record, we, we've done a lot of brain mappings with children and adults with um, the spectrum. And then uh, this is one of them, this was an eight year old male. And, uh, and was this over, like these are just snapshots of the brain yeah. patterns over certain- Absolutely, these are snapshots for that particular day, but we've done studies that looks at like morning, uh, afternoon, evening, uh, and across weeks or months, yeah. the brain, unless something happens, like let's say a traumatic brain injury happens or severe changes or medication, pretty much the signature stays the same. In other words, if I got your brain map today yeah. and you came back in a month, it's pretty much the same, unless, I don't know, again, you, you were really fatigued or you didn't sleep the night before, something like that. Or, or I've mapped out some new neural net. <laughs> Absolutely, which, right? which is the way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and treatment, by the way, we do see these patterns change. Right. They normalize right. in line with the protocol, and we see symptoms improve in line with them. So that's interesting. So even if the child is nonverbal or otherwise can't tell you, you can see that there's been a change in brain patterns based on Absolutely. therapy or other input over time. And you can maybe Absolutely. choose to then adjust your therapy to encourage that pathway, or as you, you were, yes. you wouldn't know before. Absolutely. Wow, that's, Absolutely. that's new knowledge. That is, uh, that is something that I think most families or most therapists aren't dealing with. They're literally in some ways flying blind because they don't have a, a a gateway into a child's mind and Absolutely. you're providing that gateway that actually can lead to new therapies that are and rewiring and rewiring. rewiring. Yeah. Wow. And by the way, uh, we believe that this is not only for, let's say children or the, or adults with uh, autism or right. like ADD, ADHD, or, you know, uh, someone right. with a disorder, we believe that everyone should learn more about their own brain dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. And tendencies towards obsessiveness, towards right. anxiety, towards depression, towards right. hyper focusing or not focusing, you know, yeah. all a, uh, towards impulse control, right. uh, mood regulation, all of those, they are basically apparent in one's brain signature. And we can actually look at it. Wow. And then you can see a change across time as they work on it in treatment or in, with, with you, other methods. You know, as I've tried to advise uh, some of my younger family members about changing their behavior or trying to find a new pathway, I describe it as a cornfield. Your, your, your life, it, you, the pathways you've taken are beaten down corn in one direction. Those are familiar, those are seen, you don't have, you know. Uh, but if you wanna change your behavior, change the way you react to issues, the way, like you say, the impulse of, negative thinking of anxiety of depression you have to start beating down a new uh, <laughs> pathway on the corner yeah that's you know? a very good analogy and that's exactly how it is right uh, the more you reinforce a pathway the more that's robust right. it becomes 
and the less you travel that old pathway. That's right. That, that led to anxiety or depression or negative Absolutely. behaviors or negative impulses. You begin to map, you, and this is the elasticity of the brain that I think most scientists talk about. It, it's never a done deal. Sometimes you say, well, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but, uh, but the brain is forever elastic and able to learn uh, new behavior. That's how therapy works. That's how uh, you can change behavior by changing brain patterns. Absolutely. Uh, sounds Absolutely. like. Yeah. So, that's, that's so, uh, so as you see this, I mean, let's say if, if, if a family is given that sheet with their child's uh, snapshots in it, right. what comes next? I mean, what do they do with it? Yeah, what comes next is the actual intervention, which is often a combination of uh, brain computer interface, neurofeedback. We have some other methods that are even a little bit more uh, aggressive, I would say, but usually with children, we don't use those methods such as TDCS, RTMS. You know, there are all kinds of methods of what we call neuromodulation techniques that we use to help the direction of rewiring the brain towards a healthier brain and towards towards kind of brain wellness. And we actually see improvement in symptoms. So, so we don't quite shock people anymore, <laughs> like <laughs> 100 years ago, I don't know, but there are techniques that you can, uh, for children especially and adults, to help them remap their Absolutely. brain in a positive and, and way. Or like an exercise yeah. rather than, you know, just kind of zapping the brain with right. some, you know, electricity. We actually teach the brain how to rewire. And, and you can then monitor it to see if that teaching worked. Literally, yeah. you can see a snapshot. Absolutely. And when we go to uh, the next kind of section sure. where I sure. get the brain map up again, maybe to show you sure. something, sure. I can also tell you how the, the treatment is done. Okay. So the second part of brain abnormality has to do with, uh, with actually the asymmetry. The left brain seems to be a lot more hyperactive beyond uh, what's actually efficient for the brain in, in these individuals. Then we also have uh, something that we discuss about the coherence. The coherence is how the different parts of the brain talk to one another. So again, I'm going to go back to this brain map, but this time I'm going to show you aspects of how the brain, like let's say these regions from the front, the frontal lobe to the back have statistically significant hypocoherence, meaning that the front of the frontal lobe, which is really responsible for a lot of higher functions, and all, obviously the language production is also here on the left, but there's also attention, focus, executive functions, all of those things that in uh, the, this spectrum uh, disorders are implicated. You know, the frontal lobe is not really communicating with the rest of the brain as much as it should. Mm -hmm. but it is over communicating with neighboring regions right which is quite interesting which means in a way if, imagine if you have a, an organization if you have a corporation and the different departments don't talk to one another and they don't communicate right so information doesn't get around and right. things cannot be done properly however there is too much talking within each room which basically means, again, not much is happening. They're just talking to one another, but nothing gets out of there and nothing gets communicated. So that's kind of an analogy to kind of understand this coherence business. But going back to your question about, you know, the, the treatment, let's say once we understand where these abnormalities are exactly, rather than mapping the whole brain each time that the client comes in for treatment, we just put a sensor in one area that's indicated based on their brain map and symptoms. And we just train that region, either in this case, let's say, uh, you know, we, we wanna increase some of this alpha that's missing or decrease some of the slow activity or fast activity that's like hyperactive. So that is the methodology that's used really to help rewire the brain. Wow. And of course it's more involved, but from the user point of view, the child basically is sitting in front of the screen and interacting with that with their own brain 
And to them, it's like just a game. But in fact, the game uh, is helping rewire the brain. So do most kids, are, are they able to sit in front of a screen for an extended period of time? Or are you chasing them around Excellent. the clinic? Room? Excellent question. Uh, depends. Like, we are a lot more successful with mild to moderate. Sure. sure. Uh, because with severe, uh, uh, you know, autism, as you know, yeah. it's very difficult to have them seated, difficult to put the cap on, because there's also uh, often kinesthetic sensitivity. They don't want to have anything touching their skin often or a sure. hat. Even uh, sensory integration issues are common. So because of all that, it's very difficult to get them to, to do that if it is severe. But in cases that are mild to moderate, uh, we've done a lot of work that has been successful. Uh, I'm not saying with severe, it doesn't help. It just takes 10 times more work to get yeah. a little... Well, uh, yeah. uh, it's like a haircut. I mean, some yeah. kids will sit for a haircut. Some things, you have to chase them around the barbershop uh, on the floor uh, trying to cut their hair. Um, but it's, so, so it's possible to, yes. to do this with severe kids. If they don't, I mean, I understand obviously the sensory issues. Uh, some kids like my son, uh, you know, he's able to uh, submit to touching, but he's, he, he won't understand what he's doing there. Uh, you know, um, and on the more severe side, again, you know, if you have mental retardation, uh, will any of this mapping work? Well, the mapping works. The question is, can we get their attention to engage in this process of feedback right. so we can rewire the brain? Okay, so, so okay. Then, let me rephrase that. Well, uh, if someone is uh, mentally retarded, MR is the clinical term, I think, um, the, and they can sit down for uh, that attention, the brain is able to rewire itself based to, to some extent. To some extent, okay. To, to, to a lesser extent because of the, that impairment, but otherwise there, are, there is some ability to improve functioning yeah. with rewiring. So even if on the severe side you have Absolutely. kids, then it's possible, okay. But I can tell you it's a lot, a lot harder with severe yeah. than with yeah. mild, moderate, so. Well, you know, I, I guess I, you know, I can't speak for all the special needs parents, but um, you know, special needs parents are resilient uh, and special needs kids are even more resilient because they're able to uh, manage their life to some degree with a lot of help uh, with a lot of impairment. And I think, uh, you know, these warrior parents uh, are able to do anything they need to for their kids uh, to improve their quality of life. And like I tell others, not to be some image of what parents think they should be, to be the best they can be to whatever absolutely. degree. So absolutely. And I know it is so difficult to be in that yeah. position because over the past couple of decades, I've seen dozens of parents and I know that it's often so exhausting to, to go yeah. through, you know, all the things you have to do, deal with. In fact, that may be a good segue to talk about vital neuro. We did a pilot study, right? with using some of our uh, technology with parents of children with autism, because obviously there are some of the most stressed individuals. That's right. With all the demands and all that. Right. And then we had 13 subjects that completed just a 15 minute session daily with this headphone that has sensors on the brain sure. and does a specific protocol for reducing stress and uh, you know, getting in deeper into states of meditation. Right. And I'll share with you this graph here that shows the results of that study. As you can see, these are all standardized um, clinical tools that questionnaires that are used. As you can see, this is the level of the pre and this is the level of post with anxiety, depression, and stress. Wow. And they combine scores. So basically, um, you know, they, they found it to be extremely helpful to be able to spend 15, 20 minutes a day for self-care, but not any type of self-care, one that's really focused laser-like in getting you into a deeper state of meditation, relaxation. Wow. Well, you know, I, I always uh, tell myself and 
uh, other parents, um, you know, I never pray for a cure. I pray for strength. That way, some days it comes, some days it doesn't. Right. Uh, and I think when people look at therapies like this, they should understand that it's progress. It's not perfection. It's not a magic pill. It's meant to improve the quality of life uh, for these kids. And if it, even if that chart was half as effective as it was, I'm sure many parents would dive towards it uh, because it improves the quality of life and reduces stress and anxiety, uh, especially for those, uh, well, even if it's moderate, uh, if, if moderate kids can go to be very mild, then that's a huge, huge move forward. Uh, Absolutely. And, and with, uh, with, when it comes to Vital Neuro and this particular platform, what's most helpful, aside from helping parents obviously cope with the stress, right. for children and adults with autism, right. uh, basically it does two things. One is that it helps deactivate if they are stressed or agitated and in those states that often we know they get into. Right. But it also helps build the higher functions such as attention, focus, executive functions, and emotional regulation. Wow. So those two, I think, would be a great um, aid to uh, any child or adult with autism as well. Well, uh, like I said, I think um, uh, a lot of folks come to me, parents that have typical kids and obviously special needs parents, and um, this, the, the folks that don't have special needs kids, they complain about a problem or they're, they're stressed in their life. And, um, and I tell them, you know what, I, I understand what you're saying, but that's not a problem this is a problem, <laughs> you know, that's an everyday life. So some of this relaxation may help ordinary parents just deal with the stresses uh, of life. But the fact that it's being applied to special needs parents, as you say, the most stressed out, uh, I, I want to say class of parents, I think, or any, any parent dealing with a childhood uh, issue, uh, you know, it could be cancer, it could be uh, any, a, any number of things. It's a stressful thing. Uh, and, um, to improve the quality of life for their kids or adults, I think parents would do anything uh, to just make that's that information. That's been my experience. And I've been like, you know, I think parents who are dealing with this, they are so brave and they are so, uh, like I see parents do so much and yeah. I'm like, you know, they're resilient. They are, they, yeah. they're doing something that most people don't believe we can do yeah. <laughs> to, to deal with that level of stress day in, day in. Yeah, you're right. It, we, it, we talk about elasticity of brain. I mean, I think people are, uh, they never know what they're capable of until they have to do it. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, as far as relaxing, that's why I call my platform Autism Spa. Uh, yes. it, you know, it's take a, a spa day. Way. Yeah, thank it, you. It's a great name. And, and again, uh, the, the only other message, I guess, I, as a clinician I have for, for parents is like self-care right. for yourself is right. a priority. Right. And 15, 20 minutes a day minimum. And if you don't do that, you cannot care for your child the same way. Right. So right. that's like the most important thing that I believe, you know, can help people continue to give the care at that level. Right, right. And I think that's really the key message. Take care of yourself. Uh, a lot of parents, uh, I observe, unfortunately, obsess uh, over the care of their special needs kids. And that's admirable and that's wonderful. And that's life. Parents, you know, uh, are like that. Uh, every country, every religion, every age. Once you have a child, your whole life changes and you're just revolving around that child. Once that child is diagnosed with special needs, then you become obsessed and you forget yourself. Uh, and I think you need to have a, a good, constructive, healthy family environment. And the kid picks up on that, uh, as I'm sure your brain patterns will show. Uh, so if you're stressed as a parent, you will pass that stress on to your child. Uh, yes. So trying to relax and take care of yourself and then trying to find ways for your child to relax, not a cure, but just be able to understand the brain patterns that are impacted by their uh, impairment and how therapies and relaxation uh, can help them improve their quality of life is just, I think, a godsend. I think that's the right track uh, as a supplement to any other services they're getting uh, through any other platform. Uh, but I'm so glad 
we had this time, uh, Dr. Falakor, I think your work is immensely important. Uh, we will have all the information about uh, Vital Neuro and your practice on the post. Um, we will keep in touch and if there's new developments with the technology or the therapies, please come back and tell us about it. I would love to share it with our group. Absolutely, I'd love to and we'll stay in touch and uh, uh, I'm sure that we can have another chat uh, in the next several months to come. We actually are launching Vital Neuro Platform by the end of this year and that might be a good time for us to Perfect. Perfect, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Thank you for inviting me. Sure.